was early on in the year 2015 when Lefty got sent down to Grand Bahama Island to babysit the fortress. She didn't want to do it, and her boss, Bill Handel, didn't want her so far away with so much going on. But the chatter had been confirmed. Two different sources in two different countries. The priest with red hands was beating the bushes trying to find a suitable thief for a vault job. That could mean only one thing. The priest hadn't been back to the fortress since the second incident. And even if he did come back, it wouldn't matter. They had the new security fence around it that kept out emissaries. Still, the priest was like a barnyard dog. When he had a bone, he was hard-pressed to let it go. If he was looking to break into the fortress and steal from the vault, chances are he would damn sure find somebody to do it. If that happened, Bill Handel needed boots on the ground. He needed someone he could trust to settle accounts. And so, DRO Special Agent Lee Enright, better known as Lefty to friend and foe alike, found herself living in a third-floor hotel room in one of the nicer parts of West End. After five weeks, she was starting to lose her goddamn patience with this whole situation. There were three other agents stationed working for her at the fortress. They had the full support of local police. It was more than enough to hold the line, at least long enough for her to take a full day off. That's what she thought. By the end of that day, her hair would be flecked with red. Her hands would reek of gun smoke. And much like the old cowboys she read about, she would keep her boots on so that she could die standing up. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem. Killers, cannibals, and cults. Fearful fiction and furious fact. Tall tales and terrifying truths. This is a scary home companion. It was the closest thing to a day off that Lefty had gotten since arriving just over a month ago. She was still, of course, in constant contact with the rest of the team who were all on site at the fortress. With agents Titus, Baker, and Willoughby there, Lefty felt she could relax a little bit. Besides, tomorrow Titus was shipping out to a new assignment. So, if it wasn't today... It might be never. Agent Titus was transferring to Murder 2, the frontline strike team. And he was just the sort of rough-and-tumble bulldog that actually saw it as a promotion instead of what it was, a death sentence. As for when Lefty would be able to cycle back to the States was still up in the air. Bill needed one of his hand-picked chosen few to be here. And that list, it was pretty fucking short. Until Kevin Koja could make it down, she was stuck. And with that in mind, Lefty was trying her damnedest to take it easy and enjoy the day. She relaxed. She sent out for a sixer of bush crack, this local malt beer that she had grown to love. She flipped through channels and watched pay-per-view movies. They were all shit. There was this one crazy sci-fi road warrior movie. Had a girl in it who reminded Lefty of her dear friend Lurleen. So, she watched all of that one. It was stupid as fuck. No sense of the laws of physics whatsoever. Still, not half bad. 
Lefty cracked one beer, and then another. There were periodic check-ins from the team, but not for any reason beyond protocol. The fortress had a lot of protocols around it. For good goddamn reason, too. When Rourke went bad, he went bad on an atomic level. His first stop was to go back to his old stomping grounds, the fortress. There, he and his new crew slaughtered his old crew. The Order hadn't known about his recent change of allegiance, so Rourke got the drop on them with poison in the communion wine. That took care of a lot of them, and the others were killed by hand. Except for the poor bastards that they decided to keep alive for one reason or the other. There was a gas leak cover story, and Rourke ran with it, made it public, cloaked himself in righteous armor before the community, all the while his new crew was setting up in the fortress. Bill Handel had made the situation a priority for the DRO. Lefty had been sent down here then as well. She had front row seats, watching the building every day, waiting for Rourke to make a move. They later found out that Rourke was trying to break into the vault with no success. But there had been a short brief peace while he worked on that project. Once he realized it was beyond him that he couldn't get it open, well, shit. All bets were off. Rourke held an evening service. The people in the community were nervous. What used to be a congregation of hundreds upon hundreds was now just a few dozen. It was enough, it turned out. Rourke poisoned the communion wine yet again, but this time it was with a paralytic because he wanted to keep everyone alive while the people set up his knife garden. Lefty remembered hearing the screams that night. But then... There was something deeper, wetter, older. And she would swear on a stack of Louis L'Amour's that the entire building had been vibrating. Her team had gone in, but she hadn't. Bill Handel was running that show through earpieces from the States. He sent in the first wave of eight agents, and he ordered Lefty to stay back. She was his field general, he said, and field generals don't go charging in blindly. None of those eight agents came back out, and their bodies were never recovered. None of the bodies from that final church service had ever been recovered. Handel had kept her out to protect her. And now, only months later, he had her back to babysitting this accursed place. Lefty was not a religious person, specifically speaking. But she did have a highly developed sense of right and wrong, of good and evil. In this place, this fortress straight up wrong and motherfucking evil. Lefty was on her third beer, which for a cowgirl is really the first beer. She heard a noise in the hallway outside her room. This wasn't a suspicious noise, not an alarming noise, but there were no other guests on this floor so there shouldn't have been any noise at all. Gently, she set down the beer, and she pulled on her boots. Then she picked up her gun, 
After that, all hell broke loose. They were a motley and borderline grotesque crew of outcasts, escaped mental patients, and felons. That they had been assigned to this prestigious task was entirely because their boss, Nick Braithwaite, saw zero potential in any of them. Too unpredictable, too wild, too stupid, too weak too flawed, not valuable for the important long-term goals they sought to achieve. Best use for people like this was as cannon fodder. And who knows, maybe one of them would surprise him. Mind you, this crew of ghastly geeks were not aware that they were cannon fodder. They just knew they were storming this hotel room to kill a DRO agent on orders from the priest with red hands. Only the priest and Nick were aware of how dangerous this particular agent was. Fortunately, they didn't need to kill her. If Nick was lucky, they would. But it didn't matter. It was only the attack that was necessary. For this task, he had assembled these nine people. After he got the call, he led them up the back stairs of the hotel, but then stayed back in the rear of the group as they all started to creep towards the room door. Two of them lagged behind, making out with each other. Of course, it was Debbie and Delmar that brother-sister team who worshipped at the altar of the bickering butchers. They even had matching butchers' tattoos covering their backs and markings on their front to indicate where to cut for a proper disemboweling. In the past few weeks, Nick had spent several nights with them, both separately and together. Sexually, they were dark and twisted enough to be just his kind of people. But beyond that, they served no greater purpose, and Nick was not predisposed to sentimentality. So he nudged Delmar, pushing him forward and telling him to be the first to ram the door open. Which made Delmar the first one to get shot. Through and through, in the left side. He dropped the scythe he was carrying and started to fall over, but Debbie, his sister, caught him and dragged him away. The next idiot in line stepped up and kicked the door full open and caught the next bullet right in the teeth. Well, he didn't catch it, but it did pass through his teeth and then his brain stem before creasing the scalp of the woman standing behind him. Lefty stood in the middle of the room, wearing a cheap white hotel bathrobe and her boots, holding a Winchester 1894 30-30 lever-action rifle. And in her calloused fingers, that lever moved so fast, it looked like an arc of brass hovering just under the gun. The cultists pulled back, so she started shooting through the walls. Many of them had guns and started shooting back. Lefty retreated into the back bedroom. She slipped fresh shells into the gun and filled up the small pockets on the front of her robe. She hated the thick, heavy bathrobes. Felt like wearing a blanket. It was far too restrictive. 
If you like these little cheapo deals they gave away with hotels, they breathed so much easier. Under it, she wore an undershirt and some granny panties. Even when alone, she always wore undergarments, for the sake of decorum. Lefty was a soldier, a sniper, a special agent, an enforcer, a stone-cold killer, and a roughneck cowgirl, but above all else... She was a lady. All that really mattered was her snakeskin ropers anyway. She slipped a drop gun into her left boot and backed away from the door. She left it open so she could see them coming. Quickly, she called her team and gave them the code, Agent Under Fire. The cultists were still shooting, bumbling around. These were low-level dumb fucks. It was obvious, not the usual caliber of talent employed by Rourke. And that told Lefty that she wasn't the target. She was the distraction. She wanted to call the team back, have them turn around, lock down the fortress. But it was too late. People were coming through the door, guns blazing, knives slashing. Lefty's gun blazed in return. Swift but steady, her hands a deadly fluid blur. One down, two down, stop, pivot, three down. There were no wasted shots, no misses. Center of mass, blam, blam, blam. But then three more were coming from three directions one of them bounding over the bed with wild hair and a twisted razor hook attached to a prosthetic arm. Lefty dodged to the side. At this point, they were in too close for the gun. For shooting it, anyway. So she brought the stock up and into the nose of the man on her right. It was a perfectly placed blow splintering the cartilage and driving those long, thin slivers of it up into his brain. She stepped forward, one end of the gun in each hand, and clotheslined the man in the middle right across his Adam's apple. Which, Lefty was disgusted to learn, popped and squirted juice, just like a real apple. The razor-hook woman was slashing down, tearing at the back of Lefty's robe. A booted sidekick pushed her away. Lefty raised the gun, just as the hook hand came down again. It was, for once, a wild shot. But it hit the razor-hook and separated it from the woman's wrist. Lefty stepped back jacked a shell, and separated the prosthetic arm from the woman's shoulder. Another step back, another shell, and then she separated that bitch from her life. Agent Titus arrived while she was counting bodies, seven in total. Titus was sulking that he had missed the action. Fuck that, she said. Stay off comms. They're compromised. Get an open line, call in the locals, all of them. Lock down the fortress and then call Handle. Where are you going? He called after her. Ain't you going to put clothes on? Lefty marched down the hall, loading more shells into the Winchester. There was a heavy blood trail leading to the stairs. Something told her it would lead all the way to the fortress. Once the shooting started, 
Nick ducked out the way he came in. So he didn't see Debbie dragging her gutshot brother Delmar down the emergency exit at the other end of the hallway. Debbie pulled him down the steps and paused to shove her tongue into his mouth. He tasted like, hmm, blood coming up from the inside, which was a lot different than the way his blood normally tasted when she licked it off his skin. The two of them had fallen madly in love as young teens, right after setting fire to their abusive parents and just before breaking out of juvie. They were determined to make themselves a real-life Bonnie and Clyde because they were too stupid to know that Bonnie and Clyde were already real people. It was that very lack of education and wisdom that made them so dangerous. They lived for the day. They couldn't see the past. They couldn't envision any future. They just raised as much hell as they could. The bickering butchers lived in their heads. They'd been there since long before their parents had died. When the time was right... The butchers had led them down here to this island, to this place, to these people, to the edge of a breach, to the end of days. Debbie was not about to let this opportunity pass them by, even with her brother bleeding buckets. She stole a minivan laying Delmar down in the back and started driving towards the fortress. Fuck Nick, and fuck the priest too, she said. She lit a cigarette. When she was rounding the corner, she saw Nick, and she flipped him off as she drove away. Big brother, we paid our dues. And we know the plan. It's open. We can walk right into that place, so why not? Let's go open the door ourselves, Delmar. Let's take the next step. You just have to hold on just a few minutes. And then I could take you to a place we can cross over to where life and death, they don't mean shit. We'll be gods there, just like the butchers always told us we would be. As planned, the guards were all standing down. Debbie parked the curb and then pulled Delmar out of the back, half carrying, half dragging him towards the building. Delmar said he saw a skunk ape, and Debbie shushed his crazy talk. She stopped just at the front doors to look around. They'd heard so much about it, about what had happened there. And they'd been watching it from afar for weeks, so it felt like a really super fucking big deal to actually go inside. This was the door to hell. Behind her, the cops started to chatter. New cars were pulling up. She hustled inside. Hang on, Delmar. We are almost there, brother. The door to the sanctuary opened easily. The doors had looked like they were nailed shut and boarded up, but it just swung open under her hand. Debbie was overwhelmed by the sinister grandeur of the place. And as she started to look around to really see it, she felt the place seeing her, too. It was looking back. The priest had told them there was a wound in the side of this world located in this very sanctuary. And this wound was temporarily healed for now. But... If it were to be pulled and pushed from both sides at once, then it would tear open afresh. 
Debbie dropped her brother and paced the room. She looked at the knife garden. It was more beautiful than she had dreamed. Hundreds of blades aimed straight up, immovable, set in the rock below, hungry for fresh bodies to be thrown on top of them. She got a chill, and it felt good. She took out her knife. She picked up her brother and held him close. Delmar, it's just what we've always wanted. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? They're right there. She plunged the knife into the bullet wound on Delmar's side and then yanked it slowly, sawing all the way across his torso, following the helpful markings of his tattoos for a proper disemboweling. Delmar was too near death to fight or even realize that he should fight. He was too near death to do anything but nuzzle her neck and say, Thank you. Debbie pulled out his guts one handful at a time. And when they were laid in a steaming heap across their feet... Then she plunged the knife into her own belly. She heard the clack of a shell jacking into a chamber and looked back to see Lefty in the doorway, white robe billowing around the tops of her boots, staring down the barrel of her Winchester. Fuck you, pig. Debbie snarled and tossed a handful of entrails into the air. The gun sounded off. Bam! Bam! But it was too late. The breach was tearing open and the demons beyond were crawling through. Lefty was just a little too late. She had no badge, just her robe, her boots, and her Winchester. But all the local cops knew who she was, and they parted. One of them shouted out that two people had gone inside, but they had intel that possibly, possibly, four more people had gone in there earlier. She listened to their bullshit walking. Protocols were protocols, but this was different. A hundred yards away, Nick Braithwaite sat on the roof of a van, watching everything unfold. He couldn't get any closer. Even being this close made his head fucking throb. But he had to see what happened. Lefty kicked her way into the narthex. Through the broken doors of the sanctuary, she heard ripping and cutting and low, guttural moans of pain. But there was something else behind it. A distant, echoed screaming seemed to be coming from inside her head. Subsonic wails and inhuman grunts reverberating around her skull. A sensation that she was familiar with. She yanked on the doors of the sanctuary, but they fought against her, grinding against the floor. She got them open, she stepped inside, she got a bead on the woman. 
Debbie was standing over the man on the floor. In her hands were his entrails mixed in with her own. Fuck you, pig, she said, and threw the guts into the air. They unspooled into a loose, gooey arc. And that arc turned into a gaping wound in the air itself. Lefty put a bullet into Debbie's head, reloaded, and put one into Delmar's head as well, just to be safe. But it didn't matter. Their blood sacrifice had opened the breach on our side. And now the nightmare people were tearing their way through. The edges of the breach were like ragged, torn flesh, being ripped and pulled away by ghastly hands from the other side. Lefty opened fire as they crawled through, but there were too many, and they were coming through too fast. She saw two shuffling creatures bound together by their guts, dragging away the dead siblings, disappearing through the breach. She shot a man wrapped like a mummy in barbed wire, and a scuttling, legless clown dripping maggot-filled vomit from its chin. But it wasn't enough. She saw that it hit. She saw that they felt it. But it was not enough to slow them down. Not damn near enough. The Winchester could bring down any living thing. But these were not living things. And Lefty realized the old 3030 wouldn't do her a lick of good. She backpedaled out of the room, shooting until the gun was empty and then turned to sprint through the narthex towards those front doors that were still standing open. She heard damp, gnarled feet slapping on the floor behind her, the hungry grunts of the damned. She didn't look back, not when she was sprinting through the doors into the open air, not even when she made it past the ring of little black boxes that surrounded the area. The ones that emitted little pulses of microwave radiation. The ones that weren't in place to keep people out, but were in place to keep anything inside from escaping. The police opened fire as she reached the blockade of cars. The subsonic pounding in her head finally started to recede, and she felt a helping hand patting her on the back. The cops were done shooting. Whatever they had seen had retreated. Agent Titus was at her side. He had brought her leather duster from the room and draped it across her shoulders. God damn it, I missed the hot shit again. I need to stay closer to you, Lefty, he joked. But her boss, Bill Handel, he wasn't joking. He was pissed that she had gone inside. But even more so, he was concerned with what had happened on her watch. Bill had gotten intel from Lila Ambrose that one of her people had assisted in a heist of the vault. And this person didn't know what had been stolen, but she did know that the vault door had been opened, which meant that it was still open. Lefty and her team got the area locked down and lit up bright as day. No one else was going in or out. Handel told her to keep the fortress secure until he decided what they should do next. He said that Lila was putting together a team of her own, one that might be capable of handling a trip down into this vault. 
Lefty waited. Time passed. Titus went off shift an hour later. Off shift for the final time. As he drove away to catch a plane for his new post with Murder 2. In the distance, there was a muffled boom. Lefty looked up to see a blossom of white flame in the sky, some three miles offshore. Well, shit, she muttered. That can't be good. Thanks for listening to another episode of A Scary Home Companion. If this is your first time meeting Lefty, then I highly encourage you to go listen to The Thing in the Basement, Massacre at Blackside One, and Drive Like Hell. And then you can root around to find her other appearances. Lefty's a familiar face around here. Her story is far from over. Check out the show on social media. Scary Home Companion is on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Facebook. You can contact us directly at a scary home companion at gmail.com. Or check out the Patreon. You get exclusive bonus episodes not available anywhere else. Scripts, analysis videos and resources like a timeline and a character database to further explore the world of the show. The episode was edited and produced by Jeff Davidson. Features music by Jimmy Oder, Low Blow, and Nightmare. Culla with Rising Up and Western Firefight 2. Jay Surak with gates open. And as always, Chelsea Oxendine with the theme music. Lefty was disgusted to learn, popped and squirted juice, just like a real apple. (laughs) That's my favorite part.